Have you ever thought that edge computing is kind of like a zoo? Oh, gosh, I'm not going to have to draw a whole zoo, am I? Okay, good. I know, I know, some of you are doubting this analogy, but hear me out. Just like a zoo needs animals of all shapes and sizes, you probably haven't seen a zoo with just one kind of animal, right? Yes, ladies and gentlemen, step right up to the armadillo zoo. Yeah, probably not. And just like a zoo needs more than one kind of mammal, reptile, and assorted aviary, a good edge ecosystem needs to have a wide range of different nodes. And can you imagine a zoo without walls or doors with big locks? No, you probably cannot. (laughs) Or maybe that's a script for my next movie. Yeah. The same is true with edge computing ecosystems. You have to have a good way to manage and secure all of those wild and crazy animals. I mean notes. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. Edge computing is all the rage these days. But why exactly is that? And what do alligators have to do with this? Oh, you just wait. My guest is Altaf Hussein from NXP, and in this episode of Chalk Talk, we are delving into the magical menagerie that is edge computing. Altaf and I discuss the complications of edge computing, what NXP's layerscape processors are all about, and yes, why alligator farming is a great application for edge computing. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about NXP's Layerscape processors. Hi, Altaf. Thank you so much for joining me. Hi, Amelia. How are you? I'm great. Thank you for asking. Okay, so we are here to talk about computing at the edge. But the edge is kind of big, and there can be a lot of different kinds of computing there. So, Altaf, what exactly are we looking at today? Well, there's a lot of different applications for edge computing. Typically, the way this has evolved is that embedded systems have been more of a closed architecture in the past. So very little flexibility to add applications after the product is deployed without completely changing the software image or changing out that product in itself. So then came basically cloud computing, which gave you a lot of flexibility that you could run a lot of the things and applications that you can do at the edge in the cloud. But that also added complexity in terms of latency, cost of sending all the data to be analyzed in the cloud. So a lot of applications couldn't tolerate those types of cloud computing kind of features that, you know, were needed really at the edge to be able to do what's being done in the cloud, but really move the cloud to the edge. So have that same flexibility to be able to deploy applications to do computing in a very flexible way, but do it where it matters where the actual work is being carried out rather than the cloud. Okay, now when we talk about the edge, we have to talk about nodes as well, but not all nodes are created equally, right? Is node a bit like the Hawaiian word for aloha? It can mean a lot of different things? Pretty much, yes. Uh, There's a lot of different types of nodes that you will have in real applications there. It really depends on the actual facility and what work is being carried out. You can have simple sensors that are measuring temperature, pressure, something like that, and that can be considered as a node. Or you can have a full industrial PC that's potentially doing you know, object or vision detection at the edge, and that could also be considered a node. So there's a whole range of different you know, level of node and capacity and processing capability that's needed depending on the application. Okay, so let's step back a second. How exactly did we get here, Althoff? It seems like one day I had dial-up and the next we had billions of connected devices. Well, it was a long time before dial-up <laughs> until we got to billions of embedded <laughs> devices, but it's it true. seems like you know, it happened yesterday, right? So it really is the cost of connectivity that has really changed significantly in the market. It's the dial-up, if you can remember, the, the modem days was very expensive, only a few providers. Now connectivity is everywhere, wireless, wired everywhere, and the cost of silicon and also the cost of communication has come down dramatically. So now it makes it cost effective really to be able to add communications and connectivity to almost anything today. Sure. Now edge computing gives us a lot of advantages that say strict cloud computing or traditional embedded computing does not, right? 
Yeah, so edge computing, the main advantages really here are that you can have computing right near the source of the data. So you can actually do the real-time processing. Also, you can have those operations running without having to have cloud connectivity. So if you lose cloud connectivity, your process, your application doesn't go down. So it gives you that capability. Also for things like industrial applications where you're doing real-time control, the latency of looking at the data, analyzing it, and making a decision and carrying out some action, that latency has to be very, very low. It can be kind of life-threatening situations if a machine's not operating in the right way. So you have to have local computing to be able to perform those types of functions. The other is really securing the data as well. If you send everything to the cloud, there is always a perception that maybe that data is not secure. Maybe other people are looking at that data. So if you can keep it local, you have more guaranteed that you're keeping privacy and the data secure and you have more control over that data. So what about traditional embedded computing? So traditional embedded computing basically gave you a very fixed function. So now let's say you have an edge computing device and you're carrying out some kind of data analytics on a factory floor. Now you want to deploy that box and maybe you want to do something like building automation. It's going to have completely different software application. So instead of building two completely different types of products, you can have one system and with a different software load, you can basically personalize the work that it's actually doing. So it becomes more of a flexible compute device rather than a fixed function device in the old embedded technique of doing things. Sure. Now, what kind of players are you seeing in this edge computing game? I would imagine it's more than just cloud computing companies. No, there's a lot of different players in this market. It's a very diverse field. I mean, the cloud computing folks obviously see that a lot of the applications are now moving to the edge, so they want to be a part of that. So yeah. they're introducing versions of that cloud computing capability that can run at the edge. So they are definitely players in this as well. But also a lot of the OEMs, the end customers also have their own infrastructure to be able to support this as well. Sure. And there's also a lot of different ways to solve these problems. And customers are coming out with unique ways to do this, similar to what NXP is doing here as well. I mean, security is one of those areas where you need this end-to-end -end capability from the node all the way to the cloud. And being a silicon provider, we have that visibility from a design manufacturing perspective that we can help to enable all of that security and connectivity across that broad spectrum. Cool. So, Altaf, what kinds of challenges are you specifically seeing here? So, the challenges typically are around the ecosystem. So, you have a lot of different competing software solutions at the edge. A lot of people want to be able to use open source software. And if people want a flexible platform where they can deploy lots of applications like you would, for example, on a mobile device or like a PC platform where you can just choose what application to download and run there, you need a kind of an edge computing platform that's using a PC like OS. So things like Debian, you know, Ubuntu, you know, Red Hat, those types of things are going to be more prevalent moving forward to give you the flexibility so that you can deploy applications without changing the underlying software capabilities of the platform. And that, I think, is a challenge for a lot of customers in terms of, okay, we have the platform, but now how do we build the ecosystem to differentiate and provide that third-party applications? You know, everybody's going to build an Apple App Store of their own. Right. So you have to have an open source ecosystem that you can leverage for a lot of those applications as well. And I think that's still developing in terms of the applications that can run on top. There are quite a few companies doing that right now, mostly around AI, machine learning type applications. But I think that's going to evolve to include more applications that are going to be focused on vertical market segments. One other area that I wanted to also mention is around security. We talked about this a little bit before. When you have all of these edge devices, everybody talks about, you know, when you talk about connected devices, you mentioned earlier, billions of devices. 20 billion, some say 40 billion, right? So if you have all of these connected devices, you have to find a way to manage those devices. If they're connected, they're collecting some data, they're only useful if you can do something with that data. So you have to get that data to a device that can do that analysis. And this is where we're talking about edge connectivity and being able to connect to these billions of devices, aggregate that data, and look at the trends across a lot of these devices to make the right decisions and make our lives easier and simpler. That's really the main thing at the end of the day. And also doing this in a secure way so that you can protect that data, but also to make sure that you can prevent other people from hacking into those devices, taking over those devices, 
maybe carrying out like denial of service type attacks, which yeah. has happened. Oh, sure. And they've brought down the internet in those cases. Right. So having the right you know, security features and capabilities as part of these platforms is key for this to be successful and to be able to securely manage all of these billions of devices that everybody wants to look at. So I would imagine scalability is also a big deal here, right? With connectivity and performance? Yeah, scalability is very important. So depending on the types of end nodes that you have, you can have simple connectivity that's just bringing in, say, temperature data over a serial port or something like that. But you can also have IP cameras that are bringing in high-definition video that might need higher performance, either dedicated video inputs, or you will have Ethernet, gigabit, 10 gigabit connectivity to bringing in lots of cameras and lots of feeds into the device as well. And once you have that connectivity and you can bring in the data, you also need the scalability on the CPU cores to be able to analyze that data at the edge. So you need a solution that's going to give you, you know, from a one core to, you know, many, many cores to be able to scale that performance and be able to do the data analytics and make sense of all of that information. So on that previous slide, I saw trust architecture. Now, Atav, what exactly is that? So trust architecture is NXP's name for our security architecture. There's a lot of capabilities that trust architecture supports. Typically, people you know, confuse this with trust zone, which is part of the ARM core and gives you a secure execution environment. Trust architecture is basically encompassing the whole SOC, so all the capabilities of the device. It's all the way from supporting what we call a hardware root of trust, which is when you manufacture and build this device, and you program your initial software image on that to bring it to a certain level, being able to protect that IP with secure boot, so you can make sure nobody copies your software. And then all the way from keeping secret, storing you know, uh, information locally in memory, secure storage capability, and you're going to have a lot of security keys that you program into the device to manage the communications, right. protecting all of that information, and also being able to look at tamper detection. So somebody trying to open the lid and inspect what's going on, you can have sensors that can basically detect those types of things, and you can either brick the device or go down to a lower feature set. So you can flag an event that software can basically determine how to behave there. But also we have features built in that look at somebody trying to introduce malware into the system. So we can check during runtime, during operation, somebody trying to write information into unused areas of memory. So we can look at that as well and flag those events. So again, it's really providing that all-encompassing protection. And one of the other key areas is around manufacturing protection being able to use the device to have a unique ID for every single platform. So when you have these billions of devices, you can uniquely identify them. You can uniquely associate the security keys that you programmed for them, and then be able to manage these from a a secure portal to be able to do firmware updates, to basically install new applications. So to authenticate all of that, it's kind of an all-encompassing security architecture. Sure. Okay. So say I wanted to get started on an edge computing design tomorrow. What do you guys have for me to get started quickly? So really, any of our development platforms today on Lairscape are capable of supporting this. But one of the newer products that we're introducing is basically a Freeway LS1046A platform. It's a very compact kind of a nano ITX form factor, very low cost, sub $500 platform. It basically provides you with all the connectivity you need, both wireless and wired interfaces, to bring in the data from the edge nodes. It's already got a software platform on that that gives you that PC-like experience where you can install applications as virtualized Linux containers, and you can deploy those from the cloud without changing the base platform. It's already got AI machine learning frameworks out of the chute that you can use to analyze that data and evaluate the capabilities the platform has. So this is the platform that I would recommend for most customers. But if you want to scale to higher performance or lower performance, we have other platforms that can meet that need as well. Okay. So now I know a lot of edge computing devices have to deal with some pretty extreme conditions, right? How does your solution deal with that? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, our solutions go in all kinds of different applications and all kinds of different geographic locations as well. There can be on a substation in the middle of a desert to Siberia where it can get very cold. 
you know, so you have to be able to operate under extreme operating conditions. So being able to make sure that you can boot the box when it's down to like minus 40 degrees centigrade, making sure the box can work there, all the way to extreme temperatures like over 100 degrees C operating conditions. So we design all of our processors to meet those harsh environments. And we don't want these parts to die off in the field right away, right? What's the life cycle story here? So yeah, life cycle is very important for customers. Some of these markets and, and application segments have very long design cycles. In an industrial application, for example, your product can be out there in the field anywhere from 15 to 20 years. And it takes two to three years to design and certify that product before you even deploy it. So longevity is very important for customers, and we guarantee for all the landscape processors a 15-year longevity from the time we introduce these products, and also a 10-year operating life. So this means 24-7, always on, working under those extreme operating conditions that we guarantee will work for 10 years on a continuous basis. Nice. Okay. So for these layerscape processors, what do you think are the most important aspects you'd like my audience to take away? Almost every single processor that we introduce out there, we try to provide a balance of computing, networking, connectivity, as well as the right kind of power envelope to meet the end application needs. And typically that requires some form of offload to be able to reduce the CPU load and perform common tasks like packet forwarding, packet inspection, those types of things. And that helps us to balance that performance and power. So that's a key part of that. And also, we provide a lot of pin compatibility so customers don't have to change their hardware design. They can scale across the platform, you know, and get multiple orders of magnitude in terms of performance scalability. And also, the software ecosystem is very, very important. We provide a lot of open source software to help customers to get to market quickly. And we also provide software as a service as well to help customers do custom software development, feature integration to help them from a time to market as well on our processors. All right. Well, let's talk about that. In particular, the software side of things. What does that picture look like here? Yeah. So there's a, a lot of different vertical market segments that landscape products go into, all the way from you know uh, residential, home, gateway type solutions to industrial IoT applications. And they all have different requirements. If you're a residential gateway, typically you need both wired and wireless connectivity. You want to have firewall and things like that to make sure that nobody can get into your home network. But it's mostly around providing ease of use and really security and connectivity in the home. You go to the industrial world and there's a lot of different protocols that you have to support. Sure. Both wired and wireless. And there's industrial protocols, serial interfaces, Ethernet interfaces, wired, cellular are needed there. The software platform has to be a lot more robust. Also, you have to provide real-time capabilities. So integration where, you know, somebody's making a decision to switch a function on on a machine that's going to control an oil pipeline or something. You want to make sure that happens in that right time slot. So supporting real-time Linux capabilities is a key area. Doing synchronization with protocols like IEEE 1588, we integrate that as part of our open source ecosystem. So we provide a lot of capabilities from a software perspective to enable all of these different market segments. So, Altaf, how does this compare with, say, an ARM processor, maybe an x86 in particular? So uh, we get compared a lot to the x86 ecosystem, primarily because it's the dominant architecture in the data center. Yeah. And a lot of those applications are now moving to the edge. So people want to have the same kind of software ecosystem. And really, the ARM has now caught up in terms of all of the different capabilities that x86 is able to provide in terms of running real-time applications, even running Windows is, you know, as an embedded application is also available now. Running, you know, virtualization, hardware offload for networking capabilities is really, you know, mostly on par with uh, x86 now from a software ecosystem perspective. All right, so let's talk about one of the biggest issues in all of the connected world, security. Now, what kind of issues have you come across specifically with edge computing in particular? There's a couple of examples that uh, you know, are shown here. One is around automobiles, right? We all know about OnStar and those capabilities that gives you connectivity, etc. But people have been able to hack into those systems and take over the control of the vehicle. So obviously that can be very, very dangerous, right? Yeah. 
And with now cars becoming, you know, more and more intelligent with more electronics going into these systems, the engine control modules are using high-end processors. And as we move towards autonomous vehicles, security is a very, very key part of that requirement. So that's why that trust architecture really helps you to protect against those types of threats. And we've seen, you know, the point of sale attacks, you know, there's all kinds of different ways that people find the ability to look at software vulnerabilities, hardware vulnerabilities, and be able to hack into these systems. And we'll talk about some of the edge computing frameworks that we're introducing that in combination with our trust architecture help to address these problems. Okay, so what can we do about this, Altaf? Security can't be an afterthought if we're dealing with all of these big issues, right? Right, exactly. So this is the, the challenge that you have, you know, in the edge computing world, in the embedded world. As I mentioned, you have billions of devices that are probably connected today and billions more that are going to be introduced. But how do you know when you talk to that device that you can actually trust that device? When you do a firmware update or a security patch, how do you know it's your device and not a clone device that's basically pretending to be your device? So this is where that hardware root of trust is key. And, you know, in a PC, on a mobile phone, you can use your thumbprint, you can use your facial features, your iris to log in and authenticate yourself. On an embedded device, when you've got billions of devices, that's not possible. So you have to have some kind of a hardware root of trust and a unique identifier for each box with security provisioning as part of the manufacturing process from the outset to be able to provide this end-to-end security capability and then really authenticate all the software and firmware that's allowed to be installed on that platform all the way to every single application with security signatures. So that's really is the main way to make sure that you have this end-to-end security and you can get around people cloning these devices and pretending to be uh, you know, one of your devices. Now, how exactly does this work? We use our trust architecture, as I mentioned before, to provision the security keys during the manufacturing process. We provide actually what we call a secure manufacturing software tool chain that customers can use. This will basically allow a contract manufacturer or the if the customer has their own manufacturing to use this tool to manufacture the product. And as they manufacture it and program the initial software image, it will create a unique ID and a set of security keys that will basically go as a unique identifier for each single box that they manufacture. And that information is then transferred to a secure cloud portal And for us, what we're using is a technology we call EdgeScale. And that information then will be stored in that EdgeScale portal. And when a customer buys that box and they basically register that box against the network, it will authenticate itself against that EdgeScale portal, making sure that the keys that were provisioned during the manufacturing process match. If they match, then it's allowed to basically install additional firmware, additional software, so you can personalize it for that end application that customer purchased the product for. So it allows you to have that end-to-end security capability. And EdgeScale is a service that can be hosted on any cloud service. So we partner with a lot of the cloud service providers, but it can be any public or private cloud service or even a local cloud service. Because in many examples on a factory floor, customers don't trust the data to go to the cloud. So they want to have a local server and actually have a local cloud to manage all the devices in that geographic location. So it will support all of those different usage scenarios. Okay, so speaking of cloud companies, I can imagine that you guys work with a variety of different ones, right? Yeah, absolutely. So we have a very close partnership with both Amazon, Microsoft, also in Asia with uh, Alibaba as well. The ad scale, you know, technology that we talked about, you post it on any of these different platforms. Also, we have collaboration for edge computing frameworks that these companies have introduced that we implement on our edge computing platforms as well. So we automate the process of deploying that technology to our gateways. And we also work very closely with them to use our trust architecture and security capabilities so that we can provide that hardware root of trust and allow them to manage these devices from the cloud as well. Okay, so Altaf, what do you think are the most important aspects of the software part here? The software part of it really is the flexibility and also the ecosystem in terms of supporting all the capabilities that the customers are looking for. And it's going to be one, protection for that base firmware that customers want to ship with the product and making sure that no matter what else customers do, that can't be broken or it's not going to crash. 
and then having the flexibility to deploy applications depending on the usage of that product in different scenarios, right? So whether you're doing factory automation or building automation, or this is purely, uh, you know, kind of a residential gateway and the service provider wants to sell you a video surveillance application for your home or something, having the flexibility to be able to, you know, have a lot of different use cases. Cool. Okay, so Altaf, this is all wonderful in theory, but what kind of applications have you seen this solution in action? Right, so there's uh, many different examples, and, and one of the most interesting ones is this edge building that actually is in Amsterdam, I believe, and this is where they're using edge computing technology, building automation technology, and actual applications running on mobile phones and all integrated into one intelligent system that really allows you to customize your experience when you come to the office. Interesting. So one is that, you know, this is a flexible office space and each user basically, you know, identifies the type of office space they want for that day depending on what they're going to be doing. Okay. So if they're going to have a meeting and they want a conference room, they can say, okay, I need a conference room for this many people from this time to this time. And then the system will automatically look for you to be driving into the parking lot. It will do number plate recognition to allow you into the parking lot. It will do facial recognition to let you into the building. So you just walk through wow. without having to do anything. And, you know, it will basically tell you on your mobile phone which conference room you need to go to. You can define what lighting conditions you want, what sounds environment you want. And they go as far as even, you know, having your coffee ready for you in the conference room if you want there as well. And this is all based on sensors that are in the building, cameras that are being used to do a lot of this work. But it's really putting that into a cohesive system to provide all of that management, customizing that experience like you do with Nest, with temperature. Sure. But this is done at the building level. So over time, it also learns your preferences. So you don't have to specify those in the long run. But in the short term, you can say, I want this temperature in this room and I want this type of space. And it will reserve that space for you and manage that whole experience for you. And very similar things for home automation as well. Just like Nest customizes your air conditioning for you or, you know, heating for you, you can basically use an intelligent edge computing gateway to manage all the different aspects of a home. So, you know, it can tell you if you're out of milk in your, in your refrigerator because now your refrigerator is intelligent and can talk to your gateway, your washing machine, your dishwasher, etc. If they're coming up to, you know, some kind of a maintenance event, they will alert you that that's maintenance required before they break down, things like that and managing the lighting, your programming. So all of these things are basically coming together in different environments. And, you know, warehouses, this is already happening. A lot of warehouses are automated these days. When an order comes in, you know, it goes to the automated robots that know exactly where that product is stored. They can go pick it up, take it to where it needs to go and get it shipped. So all of that area is already very well automated. And medical also, you know, healthcare, monitoring, automation, yeah. The surgical robots that will assist doctors. Well, now if you know they can assist you locally, you can do a remote surgery, right? Wow. So yes. it can be a robot somewhere on the other side of the world, and the surgeon is sitting here and doing the surgery. So a lot of different applications. Patient monitoring also is very, very important. Allows people to stay in their own home for you know longer because you can see the environment, you can see how their health is doing because you got monitoring continuously. 24 hours a day. And if something happens, you can immediately deploy resources to help them there as well. So lots of different applications, I think, for this type of technology. And these are just a, a few of them. There's lots, you know, lots more, many, many more that we can talk about. So this is actually a, a real example of a customer that the customer actually has a gateway that is deployed, deployed on an actual pole in the middle of an alligator farm. And when they need to do a, a software update, they actually have to deploy a helicopter. So, because there's no way they can get to it from the ground with all these alligators there. Sure. And they have to have basically a person that's dangling from the helicopter, goes and connects to the gateway to be able to do a firmware update. Imagine they don't want to do that too often. So this edge computing technology and being able to use edge scale and do over-the-air firmware updates obviously saves you a lot of expense and a lot of danger as well. Sure. Right? So. <laughs> Might lose a limb. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So retail and video analytics, this is also uh, another interesting area. A lot of the retail outlets want to be able to customize the actual consumer experience. Yeah. They want to be able to track where you're going in the store, what items you're looking at, how long you're stopping there. And based on that, they want to be able to maybe proactively push like a discount coupon to convince you to buy something. 
So these are becoming very important tools for retail outlets to optimize their sales environment. And edge computing along with the video, the cameras, and looking at all of these feeds coming in and sensors even on the shelves, yeah. they can basically use all of that data to customize your shopping experience. So this is also another important area. And also the other area is kind of, you know, vehicle to infrastructure communication, right? So cars already, to a certain extent, can communicate with each other, but the infrastructure still needs to be built out there. Cars are going to be able to talk to traffic lights. Traffic lights can basically now look at the traffic flow and make sure that, you know, depending on what the flow is, what the pedestrian flow is, that they can optimize the flow through that traffic junction as well. So having edge analytics to look at all of that data from pedestrians to vehicles that are connected and non-connected and making those decisions requires a lot of compute capability to be able to do that. So Altav, just in my lifetime, I've seen some pretty amazing transformations within technology. But how do you think edge computing is going to change the world from here on out? I think edge computing is really applicable to almost every application that we can think of. These products might have been called a router or a gateway or something before, but they're becoming more flexible platforms now. Yeah. So rather than performing one function as, a, say, a router or a residential gateway, you can now customize the function of that product based on different firmware and applications that you load on top of the basic firmware. So that gives a lot of flexibility to customers, prolongs the life of that product in the market as well, because now you can customize and have you know, new applications running on the, that platform. You don't have to change it out as often. For sure. So I definitely see a, a long future, and I see a lot more of the compute capability that's in the cloud moving to the edge. As you know, technology evolves, and we're already going down to 7 nanometer today, yeah. it's going to go down to maybe 5 or 4 nanometer next. So silicon is becoming more and more integrated. You're getting more and more performance capability that you can put at the edge. So a lot of this computing that's done in the cloud can really be now done at the edge. And you can imagine the level of performance and, and capabilities you can get there. That, that intelligence and AI machine learning capabilities that you can embed into that is going to totally change the user experience and the usage model for these products. For sure. And I would imagine processor technology is going to help lead the charge. Yeah, absolutely. So processor technology, I think, is key to this. People want flexible, scalable platforms that they can basically deploy as much software application capabilities as possible. So the idea is how much compute performance they can get in a given cost and power envelope, depending on where they want to deploy these boxes. I think even the edge nodes are going to become more and more intelligent because you'll be able to embed more and more processing capabilities along with these temperature sensors and do more pre-processing there because it's going to become a lot cheaper. So it is going to become more intelligent. More devices, I think, are going to get connected and more intelligence is going to move to the edge. Okay, so Altaf, this has been a lot to take in today. Can you recap your main points for me? The main things I think to remember are, you know, how is this technology going to be basically used, right? We have a very broad portfolio of processor technology that can apply it across a very wide range of different edge computing platforms and different applications. Software is a key part. So many, many customers now really want to use the open source software ecosystem because there's so much innovation going on there with so many different contributors there that that's really starting to kind of become the dominant operating system in the market. Linux is probably the dominant OS there in embedded edge computing applications now. And this also, from an edge computing perspective, gives a lot of flexibility to customers to augment their system, to securely manage their system with technology like edge scale. They can deploy cloud programming, cloud deployment techniques at the edge so they don't have to learn something new, yeah. use the IT model to manage these embedded devices, and they can get started today. We have platforms available today where they can evaluate all of those different capabilities today. Excellent. Well, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me, Alta. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about NXP's Layerscape processors. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. You can't miss it. It's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, keyword EE Journal. <laughs>